The sound is coming. So. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Uh, let's continue our discussion on frequency response methods. And we were, con we were uh, talking about Bode plot. So it's a pair of plots uh, where we draw omega versus, uh, what was the log magnitude? So log 20 log absolute value of dj omega. This is measured in dB decibels. And then omega versus angle of gj omega. So we learned a couple of things in the previous class. So for a first order system, uh, so g of s 1 over s plus p. The body plot looks like, let me draw it on that side. So it's a stable system. This is your gain. This is your phase, or log gain and phase, and so this is minus 90 degree, zero degree. This is zero, or uh, not zero, but some constant. And this slope is minus 20 dB per decade. So this is what we did in the previous class. This point <coughs> was equal to P. And at this point, the angle would be minus 45 degrees. So besides first order system, of course, we have uh, come to realize that second order system is also important. So today, our goal is to uh, draw the body plot for second order system. So so my g of s is omega n square over s square plus 2 zeta omega n s plus omega n square. Okay, I'm assuming that the system is stable. Okay, so the important thing here is by looking at the log magnitude graph as well as the phase graph, I can get a lot of information about the uh, about the system, the system's transfer function. So at whatever point the phase, angle, the phase uh, plot crosses the 45 degree line, that would be the pole of this particular system. And the gain, let's say this is by k, so the gain is, or the low frequency gain is 20 log k over p. Okay, so that's this point. So I can, once I figure out what the value of p is, I can also figure out what the value of k is by looking at the gain at very low frequencies. We had also discussed in the previous class that 
Plotting the log magnitude graph and the phase plot is extremely easy, especially when if it is 1920s or 30s, because all you need to do is a waveform generator, a sine wave generator, you have a black box, you pass it through the black box, you look at the phase change, you look at the gain in the amplitude of the sinusoids, and you can plot for various frequencies, for various input frequencies, you can uh, get the values of the log gain as well as the phase, you plot it, and then you get the information about the entire uh, transfer function by solving these simple equations. So you have two unknowns, k and p here, and you have two equations. One comes from the 45 degree line, and the other one comes from the 20 log k over p line. Okay. Now in this case, what are the unknowns? Let me put a k here. So you have three unknowns, which is k, omega n square, and zeta. And by drawing the Bode plot, we should be able to recover the information about k, omega n, and zeta. Okay, so that's what we are going to do today. So let's look at the log magnitude graph. So I want you to refer to the handout that I've given and look at the log magnitude graph on the on page one on the left hand side. I'm going to assume that zeta is less than square root two over two. And in this case, k is equal to one. Okay, so the body plot looks something like this. This is zero. The slope is minus 40 dB per decade. And there is a peak, 20 log mp omega. So the Bode plot for a second order system with k equals to one and zeta less than square root two over two, which is approximately 0 0.707. Uh, your Bode plot looks something like this. So there is a peak. It starts from zero because k is equal to one. There is a peak and then it has an asymptotic slope of minus 40 dB per decade. Uh, let's try and see all these three things uh, using numerical not numerical, but just by using the formula. So what is absolute value of gj omega? That's omega n square over, so remember k is equal to one in this case, so omega n square over minus j omega minus omega square plus two zeta omega n omega j plus omega n square. Okay, so far so good. I need to take the absolute value here. I'm going to define omega by omega n as a variable u. So I'm just going to normalize the frequency omega. 
with uh, the natural frequency. And so I can write in terms of u, I can write it as 1 over 1 minus u square plus j 2 zeta u. Okay, so this step is clear. Any questions? Yes. Can you go over how you derive u again? This one? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just going to normalize the omega because I see a lot of, so everywhere you see omega, uh, you have omega, so this is omega square, I can divide it by omega n square, so I can take this omega n square in the denominator, I can divide it by omega n square. This omega n cancels, I have omega over omega n, and this omega n square becomes 1. So this one is here, this omega over omega n square is here, and then this is the j term. All right, so what's the, so what's the log of absolute value of g j u? That's minus log of absolute value of 1 minus u square plus 4 zeta square u square. No, this, it has to be a square as well. And I'll put a half in front. Okay. So this is what the gain looks like. Uh, how do I know, how do I get this point, the maximum point of this log of g j u as a function of u? Any thoughts? So how do you get the maximum of a function? So this is a function of u, right? So 20 log absolute value of gju is a function of u. I want to know what the maximum value of this function is. How do you get the maximum value of a function? First derivative equal to 0, right? So let's take the first derivative of this value and set it equal to 0. Ah, it's a log. OK. Uh, I'm sorry, but we need to do this. OK, so in the denominator, I have 1 minus u square square plus 4 zeta square u square. In the numerator, I have to just differentiate this. Actually, it's not that bad. So 2, 1 minus u square minus 2u plus 8 zeta square u. I have to set it equal to 0. So I have 8 zeta square u equals to 4 u 1 minus u square. So u gets cancelled. 4 cancels 8. And we have left over 2. So this implies that u square is 1 minus 2 zeta square. Okay.
Okay, so that means u is square root of one minus two zeta square. So this is omega over omega n. So that's the peak value. That's equal to square root of one minus two zeta square. And this is a real number because I've assumed that zeta is less than square root of two over two. Okay, so whenever your damping is less than 0 0.707, there is a peak uh, in the frequency response, there is a peak, and that peak happens exactly at when omega is equal to omega n multiplied by square root of one minus two zeta square, and therefore this value is known as uh, resonant frequency. So we define omega r to be the resonant frequency and it's given by omega n one minus two zeta square. Okay. Uh, the resonant frequency is smaller than the natural frequency and it is coupled with this damping factor that you have. So remember our discussion from the RLC circuit, uh, the omega n was a function of L and C, zeta was a function of R, uh, the resistance in the circuit. So, uh, so that would determine what the resonant frequency of the RLC circuit is, the input output system is. What happens at this particular resonant frequency? So if you give an input at sine of omega RT, what would happen to the output? The output will reach its maximum, okay? So the gain will reach its maximum, and it will be, uh, the gain will be exactly equal to MP omega. I mean, this value is defined as 20 log MP omega, so that's the M sub P omega is actually equal to absolute value of G J omega R. And so if you have a system G, second order system, you give it as input sine of omega RT, your output is MP omega sine of omega RT. <coughs> okay, why would you want a gain to be very high at a certain frequency? What would be an application for a gain to be high at a certain frequency? Any thoughts? Filtering. Sorry? Filtering. So in filtering you want to cut off frequencies, so you don't want to filter if the gain is going to be very high. That's not filtering. How about radio? Okay, so if you, are, if you have a radio, you want to tune into a certain frequency, let's say 110 kilohertz, and listen to the music that's coming at that particular frequency. You want the gain of your radio to be very high at that frequency, and you want to reject the gains at all other frequencies. Okay, you want to make sure that you kill all the signal at frequencies that are not 100 kilohertz. Uh, naturally, you have a real system, so you can't necessarily have something that looks like a point. Uh, you can't have a system that looks, uh, that has a gain which looks something like this. So it kills all other frequency and it only passes the frequency at the particular radio station that you want to tune into. Um, so you will have to do something like this. You will have to have a circuit that looks like this. So it has a gain, a very high gain at a particular frequency and it has low gains at all other frequencies. So in radios, you want to have a situation like this where you have a resonant frequency. At resonant frequency, you can listen to the radio station at, which is being broadcasted at that particular frequency and you will reject the signal coming from 
other coming at other frequencies. Now, typically in radios, you have a tuning capacitor. The tuning capacitor can change the value of omega n, and therefore you can sweep through a various range of frequency by changing the value of tuning capacitor, thereby changing the value of omega n. You can listen to different radio frequencies using the same device, as long as it has a tuning capacitor. So that's the benefit of having a resonant frequency in a second order system, which is you want to amplify the signal at the resonant frequency and you want to reject signals at other frequencies. So this allows you, a second order system allows you to do that. The only thing to, rem to remember is that your uh, damping coefficient has to be less than or equal to 0 0.707 in order for you to have a resonant frequency. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. Now let's look at the gain at small values of omega. So when omega is very, very small, u is very, very small. When u is very, very small, this is equal to 1 square plus 0. So you have log of 1. What is log of 1? 0. So at low frequencies, your gain is, uh, the log gain is equal to 0. Uh, let's look at high frequencies. So when omega is very, very high, u is very, very large. Uh, when u is very, very large, then it becomes a very complicated expression. OK. <laughs> so let's, let's try and analyze what happens when u is very, very large. is equal to minus 10 log u raised to 4 minus 2u square plus 1 plus 4 zeta square u square. OK. So when u is large, I can ignore these terms because they are small in comparison to u raised to 4. So this is roughly equal to minus 40 log u. OK. So it means that if I multiply u by 10u, then 20 log absolute value of g j 10u is equal to 20 log absolute value of g j u minus 40 dB. So if I multiply the frequency by 10, uh, I will slide by minus 40 dB, OK, uh, in terms of log magnitude. And that's why you have the asymptotic slope as minus 40 dB per decade. OK, so if I give you, so now we know three things. At, at low frequencies, the log magnitude gain is equal to zero. You have a peak at a specific frequency known as omega r, or resonant frequency. And then you have an asymptotic slope of minus 40 dB per decade. I give you a black box, and I ask you what that system, what's the uh, system inside it. You pass it through 
the sinusoidal wave at different values of frequencies. You plot the log magnitude curve. And you look at three things. What's the gain at low frequencies? At what point do you achieve the peak? And what's the asymptotic slope? And these three information will tell you the form of the transfer function. So you have this minus 40 dB per decade. It means that the transfer function is second order. Um, assuming that there are no zeros, OK? So we'll consider the zeros part later. But assuming there are no zeros, an asymptotic slope of minus 40 dB per decade means that you have a second order system. Uh, your gain is equal to 0 at low frequencies implies that your k is equal to 1. Okay. Uh, we'll look at uh, some other cases a little bit later. And then you see a peak at a specific frequency, then that frequency is the resonant frequency given by this expression. And the peak is mp omega. And actually, uh, you have a closed form solution for mp omega, which is given by 1 over 2 zeta square root 1 minus zeta square. Uh, remember, zeta is less than 0 0.707. <clears throat> yes? Is the omega a sub subscript, or is it? It's a subscript. MP omega is a subscript. P omega is a subscript. So this magnitude will give you the value of uh, the value of zeta. This magnitude will give you the value of zeta. Uh, the resonant frequency will then give you the value of omega n because you can substitute omega r and over one one minus two zeta square in the denominator. You will get the value of omega n. Um, you have k equals to one. And you have asymptotic slope of minus 40 dB per decade. So you can actually infer the transfer function just by looking at the log magnitude graph. OK, you don't need anything else. OK. Now what happens? So, so far, we have assumed that there is no k. What happens when we have k? So let's. Uh, Let's think about that case. K not equal to 1, so 20 log uh, gj omega. This is equal to 20 log k plus 20 log omega n square over okay so we have an additive factor of 20 log k to the uh, body plot and what that implies is that this uh, function is going to move up or down. So let's say it moved down. Uh, it has to move up OK, so it's going to move up or down. And this is going to be 20 log k. OK, so low frequency value is going to give you the information about the value of k that you see here. So in the case k is equal to 1, 20 log k is actually 0. So that's why I started the body plot at 0. So low frequency and high frequency.
okay any question so far no so if you have a second order system by looking at the body plot you can actually infer the entire transfer function because the peak will give you information about zeta uh, the uh, resonant frequency will give you information about omega n and the low value the low fre the the value of gain magnitude at low frequencies will give you information about k okay so once you know all these three things you can actually construct the transfer function there is another uh, term for the uh, second order system which is known as bandwidth and now i'm going to plot the bandwidth So this is my 20 log k graph. This point is my 20 log k minus 3 dB. So I go 3 dB below the low frequency gain. And this is my bandwidth omega b. So the, the point at which the minus 3 dB line meets the body plot. That's called the bandwidth. <clears throat> so at bandwidth, like the, the frequencies after the bandwidth frequency, uh, the amplitude of the sine wave drops by more than half okay so the well the energy content drops more more than half so the amplitude goes uh, so let's say this is omega bt you will have 1 over square root of 2 so the amplitude shrinks so you give it an amplitude of 1 you get an output of 1 over square root of 2 so the energy content is reduced by half because that's uh, proportional to amplitude square. And for omega b, okay. So now I want you to refer to page one of your uh, write-up. Uh, you will see that as value of zeta increases, your omega b reduces. Okay, so omega b directly correlates with zeta. The bandwidth correlates with zeta. That's in the second plot, eight point two six. And around the value of zeta from 0 0.3 to 0 0.8, you have a linear approximation for omega b as a function of omega n and zeta. Okay. All right, so if I look at the second order system and I plot uh, the body plot, here is uh, some things that you should know, the rules of thumb. So rules of thumb, omega b increases implies rise time reduces mp omega increases this implies zeta decreases which further implies that percent overshoot increases
Okay. So this is the percent overshoot of the closed loop system. Uh, or let me let me remember from the second order system. Uh, let me try to check whether it's for closed loop or open loop. Oh, I think it's not for closed loop. It's for open loop system. So sorry about that. This is not correct. So percent overshoot increases for the open loop system for a step input. So just because you're looking at the frequency graph doesn't mean you cannot infer the behavior for step input. So for step input, we had talked about rise time, percent overshoot. Um, there was another, uh, the peak time, and then there was settling time, right? So if you look at the frequency response, by looking at omega b, you can infer information about the rise time. By looking at mp omega, which is the peak value here, you can infer about the percent overshoot for the uh, step input. So frequency response gives you information about, the, about what happens to the system when you pass a sinusoid through the system, but it also gives you information about what happens if you give it a step input. So many a times when you are doing control system design, you might be given uh, requirements that are both in the frequency domain as well as in the step input domain, okay? And we may have to uh, do a little bit of calculation to make sure that the controller we design meets both the criteria for step input as well as for the frequency input or sinusoidal input. Any questions? Okay. So we have drawn the uh, magnitude graph. What about the phase plot? Uh, so let's do the phase plot. Or actually, we don't need to do the phase plot. Just look at the graph here. So for small values of For small values of omega, your phase is almost zero. So small values of omega, your phase is almost equal to zero. And then it decreases to minus 180 degree. And it meets the minus 90 degree point. At the natural frequency omega n. And this is for all values of zeta. Okay. Here is another indicator for the fact that this is a second order system because your, your phase changes from low frequency to high frequency is zero to minus 180 degrees. So for first order system, it was minus 90 degrees. For second order system, the phase changes of the order of minus 180 degrees. By looking at where minus 90 degree line intersects with the phase plot, you can infer information about omega n, which is the natural frequency of the system. Okay. So I hope by now it is clear why Bode came up with this Bode plot idea. Uh, the reason is if you look at the log magnitude graph, which you can plot very easily, if you can look at the phase plot, which you, again you can plot very easily using data, you can infer information about the entire transfer function without actually modeling anything from the system. Okay, so think about it this way. You have a mass spring damper system, you have an RLC circuit system, um, 
and you don't know what the resistance is, you don't know what the inductance is, you don't know what the capacitance is, or you don't know what the mass is, you don't know what the damping coefficient is for the damper, and you don't know what the spring coefficient is for the spring, doesn't matter. All you have to do is pass on sinusoids at various frequencies from low frequency to high frequency, look at the increase in the magnitude as well as the phase change of the signal at the output level, plot the log magnitude graph, plot the phase plot, and you can get the entire transfer function without actually measuring any of the uh, any of the quantities within the circuit, any of the resistance or inductor or capacitor within the circuit. So that's the benefit of, uh, of using Bode plot. You can also infer information about the, um, assuming no zeros, you can infer information about what the uh, order of the system is and how many routes or poles it has, the system has. Okay. In the next page, on page number two, you will see the graph MP omega versus zeta, and for various values of zeta, all the way up to 0 0.707, it plots MP omega, and you can see that MP omega reduces as zeta increases from 0 to 0 0.7. Same thing happens for the resonant frequency as well. Okay. So these graphs will be very useful in your uh, assignments as well as exams because it will tell you exactly for a specific value of MP omega what is the value of zeta that uh, your system has. Okay. All right. So now comes the topic of Bode plot for a general system. So we have talked about the Bode plot for first order system. We have figured how to read the Bode plot in the sense that we can find out information about the first order system, the pole of the first order system. Uh, we've talked about how, Bode, how you can infer uh, various parameters of the transfer function using the Bode plot of a second order system. And we've also studied a few rules of thumb. So if you want to increase the rise time, or if you want to reduce the rise time of a second order system, you need to increase its bandwidth. If you want to reduce the percent overshoot, you want to reduce the MP omega of that particular system by tuning the parameters. Now we want to look at a general system with multiple poles and zeros and see what the body plot would approximately look like. So a general system would be S plus K, S plus Z1, S plus Zm over S plus P1, S plus Pn. Okay, so my G of J omega is K J omega plus Z1 Okay. So in order to plot the Bode plot, we need to know the absolute value of gj omega and the angle of gj omega. So, so log absolute value of gj omega is summation log 
absolute value of d omega plus z i minus summation log g omega plus p j and then plus log k. Okay, so you sum the log magnitude of with respect to every zero and every pole in the system and also add an offset of log k to the absolute value. What about the angle? What do you think will happen to the angle of dj omega? Are we going to get a similar summation? Right? So the angle of k will be 0. And then we have summation of angle j omega plus zi minus summation of angle of j omega plus pj. Oh, I'm using j twice. Uh, let me use k. PK summation with respect to I. Oh, I'm using K also twice. I, J, K, L, O, L. L, have we used L? No, we have not, okay. L. Okay, now everything looks good. Okay, so if you have a general system, the log magnitude graph is the sum of log mag magnitude graph of individual poles and zeros. The phase plot is the sum of phase plot of individual poles and zeros. Okay, and this is the, this leads to a very simple method for drawing the Bode plot for a general system with this kind of transfer function, which is find the body plot of individual subsystems. Not sub I shouldn't say subsystems because these are not subsystems, but you plot the body plot of individual components of this transfer function. You add it all up, you get the body plot for the overall system. Okay, so we'll uh, talk about that in the next class. And we'll also talk about the concept of minimum phase and non-minimum phase systems by looking at this expression, studying this expression carefully. So thank you all, and I'll see you on Wednesday. Yes.